Hey, everybody, and welcome to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast, and I'm your host, Olivia Fierro, in studio here in Phoenix with Margaret Stewart, who will be joining us a little later in the program with her hot takes on some of the books that she has been reading recently as she crushes her TBR and inspires you to crush yours. So if you have been a loyal listener to this podcast, you might have heard me compliment Lisa Tadeo when we were discussing her book, Animal, and trying to um, help bolster an intimidating persona for her, which is really not how she is. So I called her a psycho or sociopath or something of that nature, and she really said it was the nicest thing anybody could ever say to her. So (laughs) that leads us into a theme for today. Uh, Today's guest is not a psychopath, but she sure knows how to write them. And that is because she has a PhD in psychology. So Vera Korean, please thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on your debut novel, Never Saw Me Coming. I loved it. Thank you. That's always great to hear. <laughs> it is. It, it was so much fun and I felt so incredibly fresh. So give us the elevator pitch because this is your first book. And I know, I mean, I'm, I can only imagine how tough the journey is to go from idea to publication of a novel such as this. So how did you originally, um, you know, give the pitch for this story? So um, Never Saw Me Coming is a psychological thriller about an 18-year-old incoming freshman named Chloe, um, who is a diagnosed psychopath. And she is entering a special program at a university in D.C. where seven psychopaths get to go to school for free in exchange for donating their minds and bodies to this study for four years. But what she is really there to do is hunt down and kill a boy from her past within 60 days of freshman orientation. Uh, What she doesn't know is that there is someone in town who is trying to hunt down and kill the psychopaths in the study one by one. So she has to decide, can she work with these other students to find the killer before it's too late? She is a fantastically unique and humorous and bizarre and, I mean, just fantastic narrator because she's sort of, the qualities that she embodies are are very much uh, relatable qualities for a, a narrator or a character of her age in, you know, today in terms of thinking about uh, perception and, and being attractive and flirting and et cetera, et cetera. Only she has to sort of, remind herself what normal people think and do right yeah i mean there's this this element of she's constantly thinking about how do i need to appear to appear in this situation to get what i want so i need to be attractive to the frat boys i need to be fun and funny to the girls and everything is in service of getting what she wants but she's also despite the fact that she is on paper like an awful person she's just so (laughs) charming and enjoyable to read about as a as a narrator, like you can't help, most people can't help but like her, despite her uh, rather negative traits. Oh yeah, I mean, she is funny and she is quick and very smart. And she's, let's be honest, she's incredibly goal oriented, right? Um, So she has a mission that she is on. And as you tell us the story, you know, slowly we get a better understanding of why she is out to get the person who she is out to get. Um, So. Talk to me about your background as a professional in psychology. And and I don't know if I should be calling you Dr. Curry and maybe too. You don't have that on the cover of your book. So (laughs) I I didn't. But um, I mean, you're front row in looking at people's complexities and idiosyncrasies. And I mean, there must have been so much for you to choose from when you were thinking about um, creating a story that would utilize your expertise in psychology. Yeah, I never really thought that I would write a book about psychology, even though that was my background. I mean, I'm, I'm a social psychologist, not a clinical psychologist, so I never dealt with seeing patients or anything. I actually studied um, politics and intergroup relations and stuff. But I just living and working in a psychology department, you're just surrounded by all these things, which a lot of them ended up in the book, like the psychology department, the way it looks and the relationship between the head professor and the graduate students and the RAs and all of that was taken like from real life. And a lot of the little surveys and experiments they do, actually all of them are based on um, real classic social psychology studies where I just took my characters and then put them in that experiment. Um, Some of them might be familiar to anyone who's 
uh, majored in psychology or took intro psychology. So that was really fun, like little Easter eggs for anyone um, interested in the field. So this group is essentially anonymous. They don't, they're, they're not getting together to have any sort of like camp where they're um, talking yeah. about their psychopathy and, and, and they're, they're trying to, of course, I guess, keep everybody safe or, or um, protect the identities, but they're all out to figure out who is in this group and, and which, you know, identifying which students are part of them. Part of what is going on is they're being tracked by a watch. Yeah. Like a, a smart watch, mm -hmm. essentially, um, because, you know, back when I was in grad school, right as I was graduating, people came out with iPhones. But before that, what people were doing to get these kind of in the moment measures of how people were feeling. Mm -hmm. So you would they would give you a little PDA, like a little um, I don't even know what they're called. Palm Pilot. Oh, yeah. Technology. <laughs> you would have a little stylus and you would get a little ding and you'd have to fill it out at 1230 or whatever. Uh -huh. What am I doing right now and how do I feel? And then since since like many years later, now, of course, anyone can just do anything on an iPhone. Right. So the idea is that the students would get, you know, a ping at a certain time and then they'd have to say like what they're doing and how they're feeling to measure um, what, you know, kind of psychological reactions they're having to say being in class versus socializing, mm -hmm. but also creates this element of um, the feeling of being followed or it also helps you keep in touch with like how Chloe is feeling about things because she doesn't necessarily say exactly that she is say angry. Um, but she is angry a lot of the time. <laughs> That's kind of a dominant emotion fueling her. And th I mean, there, was, there are moments where she's she'll just say the funniest things because she's also focused on her GPA and she's focused on doing well. And, and kind of she doesn't want these missions and, and this person who might be trying to kill her and, and the, everybody else on campus, who knows, um, to get in the way of her accomplishing all of the things that, that she's accomplishing, some of them standard and then some of them only um, <laughs> that a psychopath path would be aspiring for yeah i mean this is someone who she wants to get into med school she wants her straight a's she's still going to get good grades even <laughs> though she's like planning a murder and when she first finds out that someone is trying to kill the students in the program she's like oh of course they're not i mean that's fine it's like very very cavalier mm -hmm. about it like no no one could ever get me because she has such a high opinion of herself when she should actually be more concerned about it. So tell me, and, and obviously, so this is not uh, the, the type of work that you were doing, but you certainly have an understanding of, of the brain in a better way than most of us would. Would these people say, say this experiment were really happening someplace, A, could something like this ever happen? And would, would could real relationships or real bonds, mildly trustworthy bonds even be formed between any of these people? Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. So, the, I mean, the study as described is probably not something that would be funded, <laughs> specifically their tuition being covered. Right. That would be $60,000 or something crazy. Um, but I think there, I got the idea initially from hearing about treatment facilities that work, their um, juvenile detention facilities that work with boys with um, psychopathic traits. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would sort of train them to see everything in terms of how does this benefit me? So you should do a good behavior or not because it's morally good, but because it will give you a reward. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the closest you get to it. But those are kids that are ordered to go there, not, not by choice. Um, I mean, the interesting thing to think about is, is someone, someone who is a psychopath, their, their brain is working differently. So you think about the bonds of affection. I mean, the psychopaths don't feel empathy. So to what extent do they feel love is a really interesting question. I think there is a psychopath in the book who clearly does feel love. I'm not sure that Chloe does. Mm -hmm. um, I think that she certainly feels a possessiveness over her quote unquote loved ones that I think she would then fight for them. But do I think that she personally is capable of love? It's a, it's kind of a really interesting question. And I think that might boil down to individual differences. Well, it makes for great, it, the dynamics of this group as they have to come together uh, makes for just great reading because 
in a way, it's just a kind of twisted, perverse version of the way people do make bonds in, say, for example, a college setting. I mean, it's just everything's kind of intense. It's kind of um, what do I need? What what is is convenient? Or we're all kind of into the same thing. We're thrust into the same space at, at a time. And, and the manipulation and the flirtations and the um, evaluation of relationships and sense of competition is just um, – turned up a thousand percent (laughs) yeah and i definitely i you know the three main characters getting together Uh and chloe calls them the triumvirate like they they they're going to try to solve this murder but every single scene i mapped out that each person has a different motivation this person's trying to manipulate this person to do this while hiding this from the other person (laughs) so i mean i wanted to chart out these are all people that are trying to in some ways lie to the others or get them to do what they want uh, while while keeping up appearances at the same time. Um, and that's what all of the scenes with all three of them together were, I just think, so fun, fun to write and uh, hopefully to read. And so fun to read. I really, I found it delicious. I found it to be fresh and, and different, and it gives you elements of things that, that you love. I mean, there's the psychological suspense, there's the nervousness of, you know, the stalking and the, the planning and the plotting and then the danger, but also the relationships and the kind of cattiness that comes up um, amongst people of that age. And so it was, it was d- delightful. So how did... Tell me how you got this book to to where we are, because as I understand it, this is probably this is not the first time that you've tried to publish a novel. So it's it's such a huge thing to accomplish and to make yeah. a, make that dream reality, even for a successful person such as yourself. What was that journey like? I mean, re- like really crazy because it was I was the the underdog for so long, like. I, this is the third book that I queried to try to get an agent, um, but probably like the fourth or fifth book I've actually written as an adult. Uh, and previous to this, I'd really struggled to get an agent, like hundreds of agents I'd contacted. I got an agent for this book, and then I had finished all of our edits. It was the first week of March, 2020. And I remember saying to my agent, like, this coronavirus thing looks pretty bad. So we decided to not go on submission for a few months because it felt like the world was ending. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what was happening or if there would even be a book industry. Mm -hmm. And we went out on submission um, the last week of May, which was when the massive protests came um, to DC. And it was, you know, very emotional. And I was on COVID lockdown because at that point we didn't even, weren't even exactly sure how contagious it was. So it was probably being a little extremely careful. I wasn't seeing anyone. And then we got the book deal within two days of going on submission, which is like a dream. And it was like a large deal. And then, you know, Vintage UK approached us and preempted for book rights in the UK. And then we got film deal. And then now we're getting all this positive stuff and a New York Times review. So everything that happened was like a dream scenario. But this is everything happened during the pandemic too. So it was like a lot of positive and emo- like negative emotions. Mm-hmm. Of like I only this week did I get to feel like, oh, okay, I accomplished something. I should be allowed to be happy. But it's it's also been really really hard because terrible things are happening, yeah. and you know you try to you try to experience some joy at the same time. But the one thing that's made me really happy is people reading the book and being like, oh, this took me away, and I got to like go here and enjoy this rather than thinking about you know the pandemic and and isolation and stuff. So it's, it's been really, really wild the past year. I'll say that. It's obviously successful writers. When you're creating a book, it's you're, you're creating this, you're telling the story that you need to tell. You're not thinking necessarily about, okay, is this going to be well received by the audience? Because those are probably the, the ones that are not well received or don't work or don't, 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 you know, engage in the way that something like this does. But it is an interesting concept to think you're sitting down to write a book and when it goes out, you're really putting it out into a world that's completely different than you knew when you were writing. And so yeah. while there are very timely elements in in the book where we've got the demonstrations and, and, and planning things surrounding events that are happening within the broader um, D.C. community and uh, across the country, um, it, it, is, it is interesting to to create art and then the world has changed. Yeah. And, and I remember 
I think I started writing this in 2017. And I think like the me too stuff happened the next year. And I was like, Oh, I wish it could have come out then. But like uh, some of this stuff is just kind of perennial, like the female rage thing is just going to be in the zeitgeist <laughs> for a long period of time. Yeah. So there's, there's vague references to protests occurring in the book, but I was actually thinking more about protests that occurred way before the pandemic. Uh, uh-huh. Cause I wrote the book in, in 2017. Yeah. Um, and then kind of like fuzzed it up so it could be generic protests mm-hmm. about anything. And then, yeah, you don't know what the world is going to be once the book is released. And now writers are struggling with the question of whether or not to to include the pandemic mm-hmm. if they're writing contemporary fiction, which um, I don't want to mm-hmm. personally. A lot of books are set in 2019. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Conveniently set in 2019 because, um, yeah, we lived it. And I think you want we want to separate from it when we're sitting down with fiction, at least, at least mostly, right? Yeah. Um, it is... It is ex- ex- exciting to be able to speak, especially to a first-time novelist in this moment, now that you're especially uh, enjoying this. As soon as I was listening to this, as I was listening to it on audio, I was thinking this would be the greatest, certainly film, I was thinking series, because it could go in so many directions, and it could be the kind of thing where every season we're focusing on a different member of the study. I mean, of course, beginning with Chloe, but then going on and on. Um, and it's just so many possibilities. And I was thinking it was giving me like, you know, some uh, killing Eve with Dexter mm-hmm. with how to get away with murder and like all this stuff that I like in one <laughs> in one little nice soup. Uh, so what what happens next with this? You, you mentioned that there's a film deal happening already. Yeah, I mean, so I think... I think we signed the film deal in July of 2020. And at the time we were like, is Hollywood even going to make yeah. anything mm-hmm. anymore? Um, so we were just like under the understanding of, I know that 90% of the things that get optioned don't actually occur. So I was just like, sure, you know, whatever. And I, I talked to, I talked to them and like, we seem to be on the same page of like, you know, that, that kind of vibe, like you on Netflix would be a perfect, like a streaming mm-hmm. series would be perfect to like, with a little bit of humor, a little dark. And we were on the same page about that. Um, I think it's more an issue of the stars have to be aligned and like everything in Hollywood is so complicated. I know that if it does happen, um, then I would have some involvement in it. Um, uh, people keep asking me like, who would I cast? And they're like, what? I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, it would be so um, incredible if it were to happen. And I think I think if they did do a show, I think people would just binge watch it in like a day. Oh, yes, absolutely. I know I would. <laughs> What's cool about you is you were really coming from an outside perspective. I mean, we, we've talked to a lot of um, debut novelists through the course of just this podcast in the last few months. But many of them are, are working, you know, uh, alongside publishing in some way or, or yeah. within publishing or uh, it seems like it's it's very rare to meet somebody who really does break in and get a big publisher big book all of that stuff happen coming from the outside uh, of that world yeah I'm glad you asked that because like because I've always been someone who worked full-time in another area I'm a scientist and then writing was my hobby but I would go to the summer conferences that everyone would go to like bread loaf and it's the mm-hmm. And I would meet all of these really young, talented writers who, you know, majored in English and then got their MFA. And a lot of them got their agents at the same time at their MFAs. And I was always feeling like a little bit of an outsider, mm-hmm. but I mean, everyone was always very welcoming, but I also felt it made me feel a little bit like an underdog, mm-hmm. but I was always kind of like, working really hard, even through a lot of rejection to just like keep on going. Um, and, uh, came up with an idea that was just the right one to, to break in with. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause if I, if I think about my first literary novel, if that had made it, I don't think it would have sold as well as this will. It just mm-hmm. this, the type of book this is, is the sort of thing that has a viral feel to it mm-hmm. that even as I was writing it, I felt like if I can't get an agent for this, there's nothing I can get an agent for. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, basically. Because this chick is a trip, Chloe. I mean, if, if you have to buy her up. I mean, you have to because you just, she's so unique. I just, you, you, you need to go on, on the ride with her. So, I mean, highly recommend anybody who's listening. You got to pick up this book because it is, it is 
completely different than than anything that you're going to be assuming that you can compare it to. Uh, mm-hmm. Vera, when you first began to love books, obviously you went a science path as well. So you're one of those people who excels in everything. But we assume <laughs> that all writers are are you know really passionate readers. When do you remember falling in love with books and and thinking you're realizing how much magic and adventure can be in those pages? Yeah. Um, you're going to laugh, but (laughs) it was my, uh, so I had trouble learning to read when I was younger. I remember in first grade, I was really struggling. So my sister would read out loud to me and she would read VC Andrews novels, which are not appropriate, (laughs) (laughs) but I loved, I loved those books that like Gothic horror, like drama. And then I went from there to horror novels. I read, I was like raised on reading Stephen King novels. And then as I got older, I started to read mostly literary fiction, but I read a lot of like thrillers and other stuff, but um, I always come back to literary fiction. So the, the flowers in the attic though. Okay. So for the reluctant yeah. reader, you know, the <laughs> introducing the, con- the concepts that go on in that, in that book might be a, <laughs> It's a very twisted book. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. <laughs> but but of course, it's, it's as long as you're sparking the passion, however, however it goes. And uh, the I mean, thrillers and horror and the tension and the emotion that you go that, that you go on the journey. It's, it's really kind of an adrenaline rush, right? Yeah. I mean, I think with something with a thriller, I deliberately wrote this book to be something that you just like tear through. I deliberately wrote it to have short chapters. I tried to have like a clue drop at the end of chapters because it would make people kind of be propulsive. Um, So that is what people want in a thriller. It's not how I would write a different book. Mm -hmm. Um, So I wanted to write the thriller that I wanted to see in the market that wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And this has all of those elements in in one book essentially. Mm -hmm. So full-time career, yet you were writing as a hobby. What advice do you have to somebody who aspires to to start writing and, and is figuring out, I mean, that that burden of looking at the blank page and all of that, especially when you love books. I mean, those of us who really love to read and we're reading great stuff, um, you, you put this great fiction out here and you think, oh, what well, am I going to write that's going to be worth anybody reading? Yeah. I mean, how, do you, how do you start? I think, I mean... The one thing is to, to always be reading and reading a lot because that's that's how you learn, um, whether it's subconscious or not. The second thing is I think you kind of do need to get out of your head about it of like, I, I can't start because it's not good enough. But I think the best writing is when you can tell the writer was having fun when they were writing um, or, or they're bearing some part of themselves that they couldn't in any other way. You just have to, I mean, literally, you just have to sit down and do it. And, and it does mean dealing with the, the writer's block or, you know, the emotional block or feelings of rejection, but like you, you can't, you know, win at a game, you're not even trying. So you just, you have to make time for it. It doesn't even take that much time. You know, you don't have to wake up at three in the morning, which is something, something I always say, you just have to take what time you have and use it and, you know, try to be reasonably consistent about it. So set the scene when you are sitting down to write and you're in your, the creative juices are flowing and it's all coming out great. It's what time of day, what space are you in? What are you um, eating, drinking? What's happening? Quiet, yeah, so, music, what? Well, <laughs> right now there's a lot of construction going on upstairs. <laughs> I'm at my kitchen table, um, which is filled with vitamins and dirty dishes. So I'm not <laughs> writing in a clean, beautiful environment, which is why the camera's pointed this way. Typically I would write, I would write after dinner before I went to the gym. So from six to seven and then a little bit on the weekends, if I felt like it. Um, and if I'm really into a story, I might want to do it a little more, but, um, I'm not writing during like lunch or waking up early or, you know, staying up till three in the morning. Um, you don't have to necessarily sacrifice something in order to, to, to be a writer. Use the time you do have really efficiently, which Mm -hmm. is, which is how I do it. Mm, yes, efficiency, and I am not an efficient person, so that's the <laughs> that's obstacle number, obstacle number one. That and the lack of creativity. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, as you tell me, what was it like when you first got that book in your hand, and you looked at it, and you looked at your cover, and you saw your name, and all of this work, and thought, and energy, and kind of fantasizing and dreaming had been happening for you over the years while you were succeeding in another field. Um, what, what were the emotions? 
Yeah, it was, it's, it's interesting to think of the word dream because many things that occurred in 2020 made reality feel really surreal. Mm -hmm. So I got this like dream book deal. And then I was like, well, they're just going to withdraw it. Right. Like it's a joke. And then I got the advanced reader's copy, which is like a paperback. And I was like, oh, this, this is like a real thing. And then eventually I got like the real copy and it still sort of felt surreal. And sometimes it still does. Um, Cause we kept getting good news and I kept thinking like, oh, well now something bad will happen. <laughs> so I kept, it, it is very, it is very, very strange and surreal. And like to go to Barnes and Noble and see your book there. Um, and then, you know, getting the box of books and I'm like, okay, this step, people are going to read this and, and talk about it online and stuff. Uh, it's, it's extremely surreal. But, I mean, good, but surreal. Yeah. Please tell me you've gone into a bookstore and, and moved your book to like a, a more prominent position someplace. Please tell me. You've I, done that. I haven't done that, but I have had friends be like, why isn't this in the front? <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. Glad. I guess you could move it in the front, right? <laughs> I'm glad I have, I'm, I'm a little like shy about self-promotion. So I did go into one place. I was like, um, I am an author and I noticed you didn't have my book out. And then they were very nice about it. Um, but I'm not that type of salesman. Uh, you probably should be, women definitely should be more self-promotional. <laughs> so um, just moving forward now, how are you going to balance your two careers? Um, yeah, I mean, right. I had right now. I had taken some time off just because the, the book release was very stressful, and I and I am going to think about um, whether or not I take off more time to kind of have the a more leisurely pace to to write things. Um, I I haven't written anything new in a bit because I was focusing on on the, getting this out, but that is definitely something I have to think about. Did your uh is there a bit of advice that you can share as we conclude that maybe is your social psychology expertise that helped you move past those rejections and move forward to get where you are today? Yeah, I would say, um, well, A, the more you're putting yourself out there, the less it hurts when you get rejected. But I would say there, there were times where it was very devastating and I felt like quitting. And I think get the rejection, allow yourself to feel hurt for that day, however much you want to feel hurt. And then tomorrow d do more. You have to you allow yourself to feel the rejection and the pain. And then tomorrow you have to keep getting up because that's the only way you're going to keep going and get better is that you have to be willing. Like if you're not willing to take 700 rejections, you will not be a traditionally published author because that's how much rejection it takes. Wow. Hundreds, hundreds of rejections. Yeah, that is intense. You have earned it. You've earned the front spot of the bookstore. So you move those books around. <laughs> <laughs> Fira Kurian, it has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, congratulations on your Thank debut you. novel, Never Saw Me Coming. Cannot wait to see um, if it is translated to the screen. But I mean, they highly recommend. The audio was fantastic too. Um, so available now in hardcover and it is a wild ride. So thank you so much for creating these characters and for talking with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Just talked to Vera Kurian, doctor. Yeah. Social psychologist and author of Never Saw Me Coming. And it's it's I think you're gonna really enjoy this one. It is it is it is very it feels very fresh, even though campus stalker is, you know, something that we see a lot. But I don't think that we've we really see many books about psychopaths. No. And especially from their vantage point. <laughs> from their point. view, yes. And it's funny because I, as she was talking about, you know, intro to psychology, I mm -hmm. thought back to, yeah, I remember that class. <laughs> that was uh, a very interesting because you, you kind of take it no, knowing or thinking that you're going to get to delve into what your own brain is like, mm -hmm. which that's not really the case. But then you think about all those studies. 
And uh, not knowing what study she involved in here is, is very interesting, and I can't wait to read it. Yeah, and it, it is just fun to get into that brain and go, okay, um, they should they remind themselves to act normal? Or mm -hmm. what is the response that a regular person would have? Oh, sad. Oh, no, I feel oh, yeah. bad for you. You know, that kind of thing. And then you make your face soft and concerned. <laughs> so it's it's really it's really quite humorous in, in a lot of moments. Um, but one of the things that she mentioned was – not addressing the pandemic right. in this book and how having all of this happen at that time period. And it's sort of like, and she even mentioned Me Too as well. I mean, we I feel like we just went through a bunch of books that were mm -hmm. a response to Me Too. And that's part of, of the storytelling. So it's sort of a wait and see whether people are going to be incorporating the pandemic and COVID mm -hmm. into their, you know, narratives in fiction or avoiding it altogether because we all are over it. I think... I think it's something that like I I was hopeful that I didn't come across any books yeah. that had it because it's just, you know, we're just so involved mm -hmm. in it right now. It's so much like our life. I would imagine that somebody going through World War II wouldn't want to read a book about World War II right. in the midst of it. Like yes. we've heard it. We we know all this horrible tragic stuff that's happening, you know, decades from now. Yeah, you know, it would be interesting a different kind of setting. Uh very much like World War II books. There's so are, many. Oh my gosh, even my mom this week was like, I think I'm done reading mm -hmm. these kinds of books. Mm -hmm. And it's so prevalent. And I think that's where it will end up going is this huge point of time in COVID yeah. that will end up being that case. But I just read my my first book that had anything to do with mm -hmm. COVID at all. And in, in fact, that is a huge set point is 56 Days by Catherine Ryan Howard. Mm -hmm. I may have mentioned this before, but this one was super... Um, involved in the pandemic because it was in Ireland. It was right before things shut down. It was like a few days before. And then it was kind of, okay, we're learning new things. And then it was a, a quarantine together with this oh. person that, you know, there's some sort of secretive past and, you know, you're, you're stuck in one solitary space with somebody you may or may not know mm -hmm. the ins and outs of and um, something happening in the apartment complex. And so 56 Days talks about like the amount of time mm -hmm. that they were together mm -hmm. and um, just from the beginning to the end of this this set point. Mm -hmm. So it, that was the very first book that I, I read that had COVID in it. And the good thing is it wasn't, it didn't feel like too much. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like just the right amount of discussion of it. It didn't delve super deep into those pieces because while it was important, it wasn't, you didn't need to be monotonous about it's it. It's not what the book is about, but it, but you are, and it's true, and we know this in real life from mm -hmm. talking to people and whatever your living circumstances was, it intensified whatever your living circumstance yeah. was, whether it was that the people in your household are getting on your every last dang nerve, mm -hmm. or whether it's that you live alone and you're like, oh yeah. my God, I'm alone all the time. Um, it Everything kind of crested and heated up and so um, was at a boiling point. And that is a really great space to yeah. create fiction. Yeah. So it wasn't, that's what it was versus, oh my gosh, we went to the hospital 15 times or whatever. It wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, oh, we're constantly tasting, taking tests. There was some bits of like, okay, I'm going to go to the grocery store by myself mm -hmm. and interactions that happened there mm -hmm. versus the nitty gritty of mm -hmm. it. And so it didn't feel overwhelming. And I appreciated that. Also, you said it was on audio and didn't they have a nice accent? Oh yeah. Narrator? And you know me, I like to speed it up. So <laughs> usually with a with an accent, I have to slow it down. But the narrator had such a lovely Irish mm -hmm. accent. It was it was lovely. Uh, I'd listen to it again. Yeah, that, that really adds something for me. Oh yeah, mm. a, little, a little zhuzh. And of course, <laughs> we know I love Love Island. So it made me think of one of my favorite Love Island UK contestants. Right? Her name is Maura, mm -hmm. and she's Irish. Oh. And so I just kept thinking about her reading this book to me, even though, I mean, she wasn't the narrator, <laughs> but I loved it. It was just very fun for me. Oddly, last season of, of Love Island yes. USA had a Moira too, remember? It was, um, they're two different, it's like Moira and, and, Mo Maura. and Maura. Maura. Maura is the UK Irish, mm -hmm. and then the Love Island US is Moira. Mm -hmm. 
And just because we went there and it has absolutely nothing to do with anything we're talking about, but since mm-hmm. we mentioned Love Island, Whoops. do you want to reveal who you just oh, got to socialize with? Yes, the winners of Love <laughs> Island US season three, Olivia and Corey, they were in town um, as, you know, last week or so what, while we're recording this podcast, you'll hear this later. But yeah, they were in town. We got to hang out with them. They were so kind, mm. very sweet. Love to see them mm-hmm. interacting with each other, taking it slow, man. Mm-hmm. They they really do like each other though. So but there's definitely lovely. a romance going. Yeah, okay, for sure. Mm-hmm. And not I'm just gonna a tell friendship. you, Corey. I was like, you know, he's a good looking guy on yes. TV, but in person, really, yes, uh-huh. very good. like, you know, he he he's a good looking fellow, <laughs> but he's also so nice. They're yeah. both very very sweet. Olivia is um, local to Arizona, yes, and so they're just enjoying their time. Nice. Around. Oh. It was really fun to chat with them. It must be bizarre for them to just come back to reality-ish oh, yeah. and with this new partner and be visiting each other mm-hmm. and then go out and about around Scottsdale and have yeah. people having watched them because it's so many days a week you're spending with these people. Mm-hmm. That's what's so nuts about this show. And they didn't even have time to watch themselves. So they, it's like kind of a mystery yeah, to they them haven't watched. They haven't watched it yet. And so they don't really know how they were portrayed, although they've heard from other people. But Olivia also Obviously had, well, or people wouldn't have voted for you as the winners. Absolutely. Well, also, Olivia is um, her own business owner. Mm-hmm. She does permanent makeup. And I had asked her about, you know, how do you how do you shut down a business yeah. without telling That's anybody risky. what you're doing? And she's like, it was really difficult. But, mm-hmm. you know, she's... She's taken a little bit of time to enjoy just coming back from this big experience where she was gone for quite some time, and then she's going to get right back into it, mm-hmm. and she's really excited to be back in Arizona. All right. Yeah. Oh, Totally off topic. So sorry. A, that was my own bad. <laughs> a brush with superstardom. I know. Well, she, they, they said something about spending money on something or, like, saving money, and I said, oh, you got to save that 50K, baby. Brand new, right in your pocket. Just, <laughs> and just keep it. Well, more, right? Wasn't it? Well, they sp- was it a hundred thousand or they was it split 250 it that they went a hundred thousand. Oh, a hundred thousand, and then they okay. split it. So fifty fifty. Yeah, fifty thousand, mm-hmm. fifty thousand. But he's so nice that he shared mm-hmm. that money, right? I don't think I've ever watched it where they took the money fully it from somebody so else. Bad. You'd be a villain. You'd never be able to make any money on those like appearances later. Well, you could go on The Bachelor and right? be a villain there. They're really good with that. <laughs> it really <Yeah>. works. <laughs> well, this has been a delightful moment with Margaret as you are ticking through. You think you'll get to 100 books this year? Oh, that seems aggressive. Oh, no? totally. You will for yeah. sure? I only read, like I said, last year, I only hit it at 70. And at this point when we're recording, I've hit 87. Woof. And already that has surpassed what I anticipated. So wow. I'll hit 100 for sure. I'll probably hit 100, maybe 110. Getting wow. aggressive. I know. And it's not even as many as I know other people. Mm-hmm. There's actually somebody who's reading about the same amount as mm-hmm. I am. And she's busier than me. Mm-hmm. Her name is Marcy. Mm-hmm. She's got a business here in town called wow. Lucky Air Plant. Okay. And we read a lot of the same stuff. So nice. got to catch up with her at Junk in the Trunk. Uh-huh. And we're about even, dead even. Oh. She listens to a lot of audiobooks too. And she's having, oh gosh, I'm going to do this name again wrong. Stephen Rowley. Yes. <gasps> Did I do it right? Yes. So they have Stephen Rowley coming into their book club. Ooh. And, and so I was like, that's so, he, I love that they're doing this. All yeah. of these These authors have jumped in on our... This is a good thing that came out of the pandemic. Yes. The Zoom access to authors that live in another city than you, that you you wouldn't be able to fly in. They're craving the interaction with their readers. So I was really excited to hear he was doing that with them. And she read the editor as well, Uh which we've mentioned in this podcast. Oh, so good. Love it. Well, this has been a moment with Margaret. This is Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. So keep reading. And in the meantime, send us an email. Let us know what you're reading. Because, you know, I mean, she's got time to add 10 or 12 more books. Probably. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. We want to hear from you. So send us an email to Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com. Let us know what you're reading and check out the Olivia's Book Club Facebook group. Or you can follow along on Instagram at olivias.bookclub or Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and please tell your friends.